this is a reading of A Toast to Herself, written by Raji Narasimha, read by Prerna. Shall we see Dr. Kesavan one of these days? Priya looks up blinking. Time has a way of splintering and colliding in this house. Kesavan is a suitor of hers, an undeclared one. The kind that goes out of sight for years together and then shows up one day with the same desire, frisking his eyes. Yes, of course, mother. She says quickly to still the squall gone up in her. She is expecting a review of her latest book in the papers. The suspense and its symptoms are familiar. A muted whistling like the inside of a telephone in her stomach and crisscrossing her head a throbbing. Joshi of the Herald has told her he'll be publishing it soon. Soon means now. The swollen present holding time in its maw. Her fifth book. She measures her age against her book and her writing career. Tall in their bookcase, her books assure her that she is 50 years young. But 50 vanishes when she sets it against her flirtation with Kesavan. She becomes 20 then. The years when she thought about independence a lot and always found it leading her by the nose into a sexual muddle. And when it comes to her mother, then she acts her 50 years of experience and pain against her mother's crumbling frame and still dotty eyes, and she becomes the battling woman, perennial and beyond age. Good. Let's hear what Kesavan has to say about this bag of stale blood. Her mother points at herself, laughing, and turns to go into the kitchen with a sudden spurt of energy. Alone in the veranda under the dense vines, Priya tosses to collect herself. She wants to think coolly about the coming review, and sees for herself the spartan and committed writing person she knows herself to be. But her thoughts slip to Kesavan. Sex always lurks in some fold of her mind, vying with writing of possession of her. Years ago, Kesavan had called her into his clinic when he need not have, and had given her an injection in her buttock. A precaution, no more, he had said, looking through semi-closed eyes at the raised hump of her posterior. He explained that there was a virus raging in the air. She had accepted his explanation. She was far too miserable. What with her divorce, her mother's active and open hatred for her for it, her joblessness and her mother's active and open hatred for her for that, her youth, her insecurity. It won't pay. Kesavan poised the syringe above her rump. And when are you going to go back to your husband? His voice glided smoothly to the question. Her answer came just before the needle's plunge. I'm not going back. The sharp pain of the needle stung and subsided. He kept his eyes averted when she sat opposite him at his desk and he passed his prescription slip towards her. It's going to be difficult for you, he said, still looking away. He seemed about to make a proposal. She might even have accepted him, but he didn't. All his natural caution exerted its weight against his urge to speak out. The minutes passed on. He made no proposal. It was clear that he wasn't going to make any. And then what happened? The sequences fade in Priya's mind. She rubs her eyes. There are dark half-moons under them. She sees without having to look into the mirror. And she feels without touching the rough and coarsened skin on the moons. The knowledge of the ugliness puts her back in tune with herself as a writer. She stands up hardy and striving. Should she telephone Johnson and ask him carefully, casually about the interview? But her mother is back, standing before her. Not at work yet, I see. She is not really being sarcastic about her income-less work, only still she finds it necessary to state these queer things about her. It's a way of finally accepting their queerness. Priya gives the bright, watchful smile. She gives whenever these asides begin with her mother. I am a useless old body, ain't I? Her mother hovers close for a near look at her daughter who could seem like a stranger for all the fights they'd had. Uneducated, unfit for anything except brewing rasam, and sample. What is it you are writing now? Story, article, why should you tell me? Will I understand? If I were not your daughter, mother, you would. You would even like what I write. Priya laughs to the sound spotting. Her mother laughs too, feeding Priya's afterthought. Tell me, they pay you well now, don't they? They pay you a decent amount for your efforts, don't they? You know very well they don't. 200, 250 is the most I get for an item. But you do four items a month. You must be writing all the time. A thousand you make then. 
a taxi driver makes more. Her mother closes up under the sudden rasp of Priya's voice. Priya laughs to soften the outburst. But she is driven to more, and I'll remain poor. You know that as much as I, so stop your make-believe. Her mother is silenced. She is too old to snap back in bandy words. But as always, she has succeeded in stirring awake the fear of poverty latent in both of them. Priya keeps a stiff face. She will not rise to the bait. She will not let her mother get away with her tricks. Her mother recedes into herself. Priya knows exactly how she will spend the afternoon. She will stand pressed to the gate looking out for the postman to bring her widow's pension for the month. It isn't due yet. The month isn't over yet. But she will still stand there, glued to the gate, forgetting to eat. Come back, mother. It's not the first yet. You won't be getting it. Priya will call. And her mother will answer without taking her eyes off the road. Last time he brought it on the 26th. Priya sighs. How often has she assured her mother, your money is your own, mother. I want none of it. I can fend for myself. You live like a sannyasi then. Your writing brings you pebbles. But I want little mother. I don't want much, honestly. I can never make you understand. I don't understand it myself. She really doesn't. Her wants have shrunk suddenly ever since she went into writing. The substance rising and forming within her seems too fine for the normal plenitudes. It seems to want tending most of all, tending the consist of intensive communication with the eyes and turn of voice, and encouraging gestures with the hands without closing, touching. It keeps her cheerful even when the hunger charges into her chaps and her lips and a crumbled kurta pulled out of the dobi's basket makes up her clothing. The pension money has bloated her mother's savings. She isn't sure but it would be sixty or seventy thousand at least. Sitting under the thick vines, racked with anxiety about the review, the face of K7 frying in and out in a degenerate sexual recall. Priya slides off to a calculation of her mother's assets. 750 a month in the bank for 8 years amounts to 72,000. In 10 lives, she wouldn't see a sum like that. You must be thinking me a greedy old crone. Her mother flits around her table sometimes, watching her intent writing look with jealous scrutiny and smudging it wantonly boldly. What do you want me to say, mother? Priya snaps, her brows unlocking under the impact. I will not play mother comfort. Enjoy your guilt yourself. It's lulling under the vines. Priya disengages herself from their protective warmth and goes to telephone Joshi. How much should she have to put up to stop this insidious tribute to money her mother forces out of her? She's thinking this out as she walks to the phone against her mother's 72,000. How much will she need as fortification against these marauding into her privacy? Joshi's number is engaged. She tries again. Still engaged. The downward keeps of the engaged signal carry her down with them to memories of K-1. Her next memorable meeting with him was in the flush of a wrestle with her first novel. He had been sent for by his mother. Why have I sent for you, doctor? Her mother had lain back stagily in her chair pressing the all too true far from sham pains in her heart. What does it matter if this rickety heart stops? Toot tooting and cluck clucking, composing her with his competent medical hands, he had fixed inquiring and accusing eyes on Priya. He didn't need to ask if she had joined her husband. Her defensive and hostile eyes told him all. She hadn't aged unduly. He hadn't failed to notice. He smiled in spite of himself. What are you doing these days? He was playfully possessive. Writing, her mother snapped. Stories, etc.? Layman's curiosity shone in his eyes. Sort of, she smiled formally. Why don't you let me see them? The Dumkov would have never known what to make of them. He didn't really know English even though he spoke it. She was afraid suddenly. What if he quizzed her? What if he got out of her all those little secrets about writing that formed from the duplicities of making art from life? K7 saw her fidgeting. It revived his own inhibitions and at the same time his sympathies. Priya felt herself go woman and winding like a moment. She would have liked to rest her head on his chest and make the male comfort she had rejected all these years. She wished she could take a respite from the exacting taskmaster of writing to which she had bound herself. Tell her doctor. Her mother wailed, face turned full to him and in sharp profile to her. Explain to her that writing is for those with money. For those like her, it is a hobby only. Explain that to her doctor. Make her understand. Joshi's number is still engaged. In the waiting for the line to clear, her anxiety about the review mounts. 
What is a review? Just words. One more noise amongst many. Will you stop writing if this review doesn't appear? She asks herself sternly and hears herself whine. Yes, I might. Yes, you might. The pronoun changes as she addressed herself, linking up with her ventriculist voice. Something will break in me. Something will break in you. The pronoun clashes. She moves away from the telephone needing distance and space. From the balcony, she sees her mother down below shuffling about the patch of grass. Later in the afternoon at 4.30, she is able to contact Joshi. It's coming this week. Joshi sounds light-hearted. The pages must have been made up and put to bed. Now the fear is closing and biting like a mask. Her movements retract inwards, stiff-jointed. Twice in the night, she wakes up and tries to push away the boa's fangs of fear. In the morning, the paper is on the porch. The judgment on her lies in its folds. Under stress, Priya's reading becomes a crab-like backward and forward movement. She alights somewhere in the middle of a sentence, goes up a little and then skims down, picking out words that seem key and leading. Sensitive, she picks out. A cliché but encouraging. Imbued with life. She takes in and wins back quickly to the head of the sentence. Characters are, is the head. She smiles severely. Cliché, cliché. Who was the reviewer? The name is vaguely familiar. A welcome addition to the growing body of Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. She grimaces in pleasure and disgust. Well, it's a nice review. Flattering even. Elation possesses her. She lets herself be possessed by it before good sense and anticlimax catch up. It is night. A navy blue sky lies looped above. Priya Kesuvan and her mother are on the lawn sipping lemonade. The doctor is tearing the skin off the night to see her face. He has seen it already. It wasn't dark when he came. And he has seen the still presentable face and form of her. But he wants to see them again to make sure his fluttery voice sails up to her in the dark. So you have become a big writer. I saw a review of your book in the paper today. Pia pauses before the next sip of her lemonade. She doesn't think it is necessary to reply to him. She gives a polite laugh. She can feel the doctor's smile and attention hammering her. She lets them hammer her on. How much royalty has she got? Ask her that. She has got nothing. Tell me if I'm wrong. Her mother may not sound bitter about her poverty, but she is inserting all right under her open manner. The doctor is confused as usual. Money isn't everything, Amma. He murmurs. And then he turns to Priya suddenly aggressive. Why don't you let me see all that you have written these years? Why are you still hiding them from me? Very well, I shan't hide them. Her response catches them unawares. Gliding along the cool grass, she goes in and comes back to the full set of her books. She puts them on the table. There, that's the lot. She steps away from them and in the dark sees them huddle like children separated from their mother. Trapped in their jackets, they do seem like her physical offspring sprung from the clay and kill of her body. The doctor picks up the ones on the top, feeling their girth and shape. They are all yours? He asks in wonder. They are, Priya laughs. He picks them up one after the other till they are spread in both his hands. His hands became heavy and populous with them. For many seconds he stands thus laden. Then he begins to put the books back on the table, offloading them like a prize cargo. I will read them, he says solemnly as if taking a vow. He never will, Priya knows. They are not popular reading, and her English made heightened the subjective will be a sore trial to him. Her mother has melted too. Haven't you really made even a paisa from them all, Priya? For all the hours you have spent on them, not a paisa you have made. Tomorrow she might well change. Tomorrow in the clear light of the day, her mother might well not be any more the kindly person she is now. But tomorrow a lot of things might well change. Kesavan's growing up may no longer mean anything. The review will certainly fade into the irrelevance it is. Tomorrow she will be again at her game of warming into herself and seeing what she has come up with. But that's tomorrow. Today she will joke with the doctor. She will laugh with her mother and she will drink lemonade. She will forget and drink a toast to herself. Thank you for listening.